this, how this patient is saying, and that always makes it more fun. Um, so we'll look at circadian physiology, look at each of the different circadian rhythm disorders, a little bit of case on each of those and how we treat those folks. So we already talked about this whole thing right here. The melatonin, suprachiasmatic nucleus, pineal gland, the whole roundy round there. So we've talked about this already as well, the homeostatic and endogenous cycle. So our endogenous circadian cycle is really based on about 24.2 hours. It's not exactly a 24 hours and it's controlled by part of the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The determinant of that circadian phase is actually the lowest core body temperature, the nadir of core body temperature. And so you'll kind of see that core body temperature when we look at treatment of certain circadian rhythm disorders is very, very important. Now, it's not like you're running around measuring core body temperature on patients, and it's not something that you're going to actively order. I want to know when the patient's core body temperature is, but we can pretty well decide that we know everybody's normal native body temperature is about the same time as everybody else's, so we'll look at that. So we talked about the process by which light synchronizes the suprachiasmatic nucleus, so retina, suprachiasmatic nucleus, pineal, back around through melatonin. So light exposure is very, very important. So our, our lowest body temperature, our nadir of core body temperature, if we give light before that, so our core body temperature nadir is usually at nighttime when we sleep. So if we, if we provide light exposure prior to that, we can delay the phase, and if we provide light after that, we can advance the phase, and we'll talk about phase advance and delay, delay and advance sleep phase in just a moment. So, <clears throat> Light can influence our shift, whether it be advanced or delay, and the magnitude of that shift is based on how much light and for how long that we give that light. So, case number one. Mary's a 17-year-old high school student, complains of the inability to fall asleep until 3 a.m. without significant difficulty waking for school with significant difficulty waking for school. She has missed multiple days from school and is currently failing several of her morning classes. When allowed, she prefers to sleep until around 1 p.m. She is able to sleep for seven hours on weekends and feels refreshed. However, during the school week, when she is forced to get out of bed earlier, she often falls asleep during her classes. So this is the classic teenage brain. I prefer to go to bed between midnight and 2 a.m. and get up between 10 and noon. So as the brain develops, this is normal. It becomes abnormal when it affects our academic, social, or workplace function, or our relationships. So what is this? Well, we got to figure out, does she have any medical conditions? All of those things that I had on the insomnia list, right? So what are our medical history like? What current medicines are you taking when you drinking caffeine? I want to make sure that we can rule out any other condition, thyroid condition. Are we using any substances? Did I get a sleep diary? Actigraphy? You know, actigraphy of old used to be uh, sheets and sheets and sheets of paper looking at basic activity. Were you awake? Were you not? Were you rested? All this kind of stuff. Now you've got Apple watches and whatever those other things are. Fitbits. Fitbits. Yeah, and, and, and even the sleep number bed, they all have actigraphy built into them. And so it's now a lot easier to get actigraphy related data. Now, is it really accurate all of the time? No. But patients are even more, more educated on what is an actigraph, an actigraphy, because they have these Fitbits and Apple Watches and smart beds and all this kind of stuff, bless you, that can give us some information about when they're going to sleep, when they're getting in bed, what, how, is, how are you pairing that information, because you can pair the actigraph with what they're writing down on their sleep diary to see does it jive or not. So 
She's got a delayed sleep phase. So according to the International Classification of Sleep Disorders, a delay in the phase of the major sleep period in relation to the desired sleep time and wake time. Okay? So this is classic for the teenage brain, but abnormal as we have to get into the college years or the work function years. Oftentimes these people become shift workers or they, they uh, are the ones that choose to work overnight shifts if they go into medicine or whatever it may be because they're naturally night hours. Either that or they become IT people. <laughs> I kid you not. I've seen more IT people that are delayed sleep phase folks because they like to do their little tinka tinka tink on this computer late late into the night and then play their little games with their headsets with all their people and they this is this is what they are. Okay? So it's much more common in adolescents than it is in adults. In adolescents we just need to reassure them that the brain should develop and it should go away over time. But if it starts to interfere with school or work activities, then we have to look at treating that. We know <clears throat> that there are some genetic propensities for this, so it can run in families, um, folks that have, have uh, delayed sleep phase. We know that there's a lot of social factors that play into this. So I talked about blue wavelength light and your computers, your iPhones, your iPads, your television sets, all of those kinds of things um, uh, that uh, will affect that whole suprachiasmatic nucleus pineal feedback root loop. We also know that there are a number of substances that folks will take or ingest that will affect the whole brain activity pathway which will not allow us to slow down and go to sleep and can delay our sleep phase as well. So the primary treatment of this is you give light therapy in the morning. You're trying to push their phase backwards. Okay, so what we're doing is there's a particular company, there's one called the Light Book. Um, there, well, there are several out there, but the Light Book is the one that I like the best. It puts out true blue wavelength light, and what we want to do is we give them 30 minutes of bright light therapy when they first get up. So let's say their typical wake time is 1 p.m. This is an arduous process. You back them up 30 minutes at a time. So we're going to do 30 minutes of bright light at 12.30 for up to a few weeks. And then we're going to back it up to noon. And then back it up to 11.30 and then back it up. So you're going to do about 30 minute increments, 30 minute bright light therapy for a few weeks before you back it up. Somebody has to be very dedicated to want to shift their delayed sleep phase. Also melatonin is very important in this as well. Either melatonin or uh, Rameltion, Rosarum also works through the same system. So what we want to do is we want to time that melatonin 12 hours before we give them the bright light therapy. So that means they're constantly having to move both their melatonin and their bright light therapy. So if we're going to give the bright light therapy at 12.30 in the daytime, they need to take their melatonin at 12.30 at nighttime. Then when we back up to, to midnight, we're going to do melatonin at midnight bright light at noon. So we're simultaneously backing both of those up. The reason being is we're using that endogenous melatonergic system both from the melatonin supplementation side and from the light activity side, retina to suprachiasmatic nucleus. We're using both of the sides of the suprachiasmatic nucleus to force that shift backwards. Does that make sense? Yes? I thought you said you're supposed to take melatonin two hours before you want it to. That's only if you're using it for insomnia. Okay. This we're dealing with shifting a phase and it's a completely different method of treatment. Okay? okay, So you are correct that if we're just using it for a sleep onset insomnia, we want to do it two hours before. But remember that's after we've ruled out all of these other things. Okay, but good question. So case number two, anybody have any questions about the late sleep phase? Case number two, Harvey's an 81 year old widowed male who resides in an assisted living facility complains of insomnia characterized by early morning awakening at 3 a.m. with a complete inability to return to sleep. His blood pressure is well controlled on lisinopril. His recent annual physical showed no abnormalities. CBC, CMP, TSH are all normal. His Minnesota multiphasic, that's supposed to be personality inventory. Um, no, that's the mini mental status exam is normal. So he's not, does, he's not dealing with the dementia or, a, or a, the um, DSM-5 is a, is a, the, the 
neurocognitive development, uh, neurocognitive issue. Um, we're not dealing with a depression because his back depression inventory um, is, is normal. Okay, so what is, what is Harvey doing? <coughs> we're going to see why he's old and that's how they sleep. Okay, so first we want to look at his medical history. Again, it's the same thing. It's that 15 minute visit that I told you you had that little bit of time to try to figure out what's really going on with these folks. So we're looking at all the same things. Medical history, current medicines, you know, is he, some of these older folks, for some reason, I don't know why, they want coffee with every meal. And they'll drink their coffee all day long. Is it the caffeine that's, that's potentially stimulating them somewhat? We did some blood work on him. We looked at his sleep diary. And so the sleep diary told us a whole lot. What did it tell us? He goes to bed at 6 o'clock every night. So, so he, he's done what? He slept for nine hours. I mean, what do you tell Harvey? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. So he's got an advanced sleep phase. So there's no, no biological, biochemical, or anatomic reason can be for this. It can't be that he's got a tumor or some other neurochemical abnormality, this is just, it's, it's benign, it's there, and you found it, it's there. So it's presumed to be the opposite of the delayed sleep phase in terms of the circadian rhythm system pathophysiology. So instead of him delaying going to sleep and delaying getting up, he's advanced his going to sleep and advanced his getting up. So he's getting a regular or a normal number of hours of sleep but he feels it's abnormal because he's describing it to you as insomnia. So this is the little old man, but earlier when I told you the little old lady that comes into him and says, I've got insomnia, sweetie, I need some Ativan to sleep. I wake up at three o'clock every morning and I can't go back to sleep. Okay, well, unless you ask the right questions, you may give Martha a sleep aid and she doesn't really need a sleep aid because now you're putting her back to sleep and she's sleeping how many hours a day and she doesn't need to, okay? so. About 1% of middle-aged, older adults, this number kind of keeps moving as our population continues to live longer. Um, and so, you know, what truly is middle-aged now? As I get closer to certain ages, I start saying that middle age moves further out from where I actually really am. So you'll get there one day as well. You used to think like 40 years old, that person's old, and now that I'm past that, I'm like, Dang, 40 is young. 50 is looking awful young, too. So. I'm 60. That's the new 45. There, there you go. There you go. There you go. So we do know that there's some genetic propensity for advanced sleep phase. So we actually know that this is an autosomal, autosomal dominant variant. So if we look at our, it depends on which geneticist you want to talk to. Is it a Punnett or a Pune square? You can actually look at families and, and deal with their genetic counseling when it comes to looking at autosomal dominant variant when, when we get put into the assisted living facility or the nursing home. Something that you can add to your genetic counseling list. Um, so this is thought to be that their circadian pacemaker gets a little off. Why do you think that is? What did I tell you earlier in the, the plethora of information that I've told you about melatonin and as the brain ages? There's less of it there. So that, that's, that whole endogenous system probably gets thrown off a little bit because uh, the gasoline that's in that system doesn't have the same octane that it used to have. Okay? So what do we do? You're going to see a real theme about light and melatonin in all of this. So you actually want to give them light therapy before bedtime. You want to give them light therapy before their, their 6 p.m. bedtime. So what you want to do is you want to be pushing them backwards. Stimulate that retina to shut that melatonin production off, how big or little it might be for them. 
but keep that suprachiasmatic nucleus activated so it's stay it's saying stay awake, stay awake. So that whole wake promotion system is saying stay awake, stay awake. We know that melatonin is not a great choice here. Even though that their brains have some deficiency in melatonin, the timing of it just has really not been worked out. How do you actually really do that? We don't know. It's been studied all over the board, and so melatonin supplementation in these folks hasn't really been a, a, a big thing. What we have done is seen some limited benefit to weight promotion in the afternoons. So in, in some people, this really bothers them. There's a lot of older folks that say, this is how I am, I don't really care. Now that you've explained it to me, I'll get up and drink my coffee at 4 a.m. and read the newspaper and, and whatever, I'm good with that. Now that you've explained to me what it is. There are some that say, no, this really bothers me and I wanna do something about it. Well, we can do this, but there's also some limited, some limited information that shows that, that we can wake promote them in the afternoon by utilizing either a stimulant or a non-stimulant weight-promoting agent. So, modafinil is pro-vigil, armodafinil is new vigil, methylphenidate, sort of like your Ritalin products, amphetamine or dextroamphetamine products, Vyvanse, and a million other things that are your Adderall and that kind of stuff. So, those will stimulate the weight-promoting areas of the brain such that they don't have the drive to want to sleep until later. It's very rare that I have done this. The reason being is a lot of these folks have other comorbid medical conditions, and if they've got any cardiovascular condition or something like that, you really don't want to be pumping a stimulant into them. So it's not common that we actually will try to delay the, the, the sleep onset of a patient who has an advanced sleep phase. Yes. Do you see this more in the winter months? Not necessarily. No. no. No, in patients that have a delayed, I mean, an advanced sleep phase, it's year round. They just, that's how they are. In the winter months, you got to start looking at seasonal affective stuff. Does the afternoon weight promotion include lunch exercise, different periods of the day? Well, exercise can help. You can have them exercise in the afternoon to, to have endogenous production of, of uh, Anyway, weight promoting chemicals. Um, so exercise in the afternoon can be good. Oftentimes though, if they're in the assisted living or the, or the you know, nursing facility, anytime they do their armchair exercises, it's usually at 8 a.m. because that's when the physical therapist is there and by two she's out of there. And so it's hard for them to then do some sort of exercise routine on their, on their own. And uh, this is much more commonly seen in elderly debilitated or folks that are living in some sort of uh, assisted living community or something like that you can see it at home most of those folks that are still independent at home just figure out i'll work around it once i know what's going on now grandma oftentimes argues about wanting the out of it she's the hardest one to deal with i'm just telling you so number three olga 38 year old norwegian scientist traveling to new york for a four-day conference she's traveling across six time zones she typically adjusts to westbound travel without difficulty. Upon returning home, she experiences insomnia and daytime sleepiness in the morning hours for the next 10 days. What's going on with Olga? Jet lag. You got jet lag. Why is this? Why is westbound travel easier to deal with than eastbound travel? Time goes back. The sun goes with you're having you're having light at a different time of your core body nadir that's keeping you awake but when you're going back the other way you're really screwing yourself up how long does it take you to adjust about 10 to 14 days so jet lag is actually a real thing it's actually called jet lag disorder typically consists of insomnia and excessive daytime sleeping is associated with trans meridian jet travel Associated impairment of daytime function, general malaise, can present with some gastrointestinal disturbances, or just general blah. The symptoms occur because the endogenous circadian cycle is misaligned to the external clock. So it's light being shown to you at the wrong time as it pertains to your core body temperature nadir. 
So eastbound flights are much more problematic. One reason is, is the endogenous period of the sleep-wake rhythm is slightly longer than 24 hours, so this can facilitate some adaptation as you move west. So how do we treat it? Bright light. Avoidance of light. It's all about timing. In this case, it's all about timing. And the problem is, is this right here. So light encountered in the wrong circadian time. So this explains kind of what's going on. So in our case history, all was traveling eastward from New York to Norway, a six hour time zone change. If the nadir of her core body temperature in New York is 5 a.m., this will correspond with 11 a.m. Norwegian time. When she arrives back in Norway in the morning, she'll get exposed to bright light before her nadir, causing the phase delay, hindering her adaptation to that circadian rhythm. So if we look at the phase response curve with light and the circadian rhythm, she should avoid light exposure prior to 11 a.m. and then expose herself to bright light therapy after 11 a.m. to get that rhythm back on track. It's kind of complicated, but so jet lag's a real thing, and there's a real way to treat it. Oftentimes it's done incorrectly just because we're not looking at what it really has to do with is core body temperature. When does that typically happen? And when should we then induce light therapy? Melatonin also, again, can be of benefit, but instead of the two hours, it's a 12 hour before that light therapy. So it's the same concept of dealing with that delayed sleep phase. So that's basically all jet lag is, is you've got a temporary delayed sleep phase because you're moving across time zones. Does that make sense? Okay. Ben, 48 year old male, who, do you think the cases are helpful? Does yeah. it make it easier to understand? Okay. Ben's a 48 year old male who works 14 consecutive nights, 7 a at a oil platform in the Gulf of Mexico. He suffers from severe sleepiness the first nights until his rhythm gradually adjusts. Similarly, following return from home after his 14 night work period, he struggles with readaptation back to his normal day oriented rhythm. He wonders if something can help him adapt more easily. What's going on with him? The shift worker. So shift work sleep disorder is also a real thing. You see this in police officers, firemen, trash truck workers, these guys, moms, dads, they're shift workers, right? If you got a, if you got a young child at home, you know, you could be working all night long. I don't mind working me all night long for quite some time. So, shift work. Um, the problem with these folks is, is that they're in a constant state of misalignment. They'll be on work for a while, and they'll adapt to that, and then they'll go back, and they'll adapt the other way. And so, some of them have adapted by just saying, okay, on my days off, I'm just going to keep my normal shift work type lifestyle. So they'll sleep all day and they'll stay up all night. But it's not real conducive to marriages and relationships and to getting things done. I mean, the car oil change place ain't open at 2 a.m. And so these folks oftentimes have a little bit of trouble assimilating into the normal society if they keep that kind of cycle. The other problem is is that if they constantly keep trying to shift back, they'll spend, you know, if they say they're a seven day on, a seven day off, they'll spend their first three or four days after they're off their shift trying to shift their cycle back and feel miserable and then I'll have a couple of decent days and then they're back on the shift again and having to reassimilate to that. So shift workers just really have a really difficult time dealing with life in general. Um, and what makes it even worse is if you have people who are on rotating shifts. So I've got a patient who works in um, police dispatch and their shift is rotating all the time. So two days this week they may be on days and then they're off a day and then they work the night shift and then they're off a couple of days and then they work the three to 11 shift. 
and it's just their bodies can never assimilate as to what's going on, so they're constantly fatigued, tired, run down. So, bright light therapy can be a benefit, but it's difficult to time depending on what they're actually wanting to do with light. Usually, what we do with these folks is weight promote them. Is that on here? Yeah, here you go. So there's actually medication that's approved, modafinil and r modafinil, have an indication through the FDA for the treatment of excessive sleepiness in folks who suffer from, from shift work sleep disorder. So typically, instead of us trying to move them around with light and melatonin because they're just going to go right back onto that shift. So all of the hard work that you're trying to do with light and melatonin over a few days is going to be undone when they go back. So typically what we do is we will utilize a wake promoting agent so that during those days that they're off that they can try to force themselves to stay awake during regular daylight hours. It's kind of a miserable existence but sometimes that's all we can do. So free running type. So there is what's known as a free running type, meaning that there's no, that's a non-entrained 24-hour sleep-wake cycle or syndrome. Um, this is really kind of only seen in individuals that have no cues in life. Okay, so they they are completely isolated from time cues. So let's say you put somebody in space. Do they really have time cues? Does the sun come up and go down? And so you're looking out the window and you may pass by and there's the sun and there's the dark and there's the sun. They've got really no environmental time cues, right? So what about people that live in Alaska and you've got half the year it's always light and half the year it's really, really dark? they're absent of a lot of those environmental time cues. So, so some of those folks can actually develop this, this free running type to where their, their sleep and wake rhythm is just all over the place. And we've seen this to where people will just continue to delay their sleep phase until they roll all the way back around and they'll start over again. So I go to bed at midnight, and then it moves to I go to bed at 2 a.m., and then I go to bed at 4 a.m., and then I go to bed at 6 a.m., and then I go to bed at 8 a.m., and now I'm going to bed at noon, and they just rotate all the way around the clock. Part of it can be because they're absent of environmental cues. Others, it's just that some patients, their, their endogenous cycle is just the neural circuitry is wrong, and we don't know why that is. We can see this in folks that are blind. So you've probably seen the commercial recently for non-24 or whatever the, the commercial is about individuals that are, that are blind with a, a sleep medicine that uh, can try to help entrain them to a 24-hour cycle. It's basically just a melatonergic system uh, medication. So folks that are truly blind or even in super, super, super severe cases of cataracts where they are inoperable or something of that nature to where they just don't have good light cues that um, these folks are often, we can try to re-entrain their circadian rhythm with melatonin at a given time. Uh, light therapy and really, really doing good because they're not getting light activation of the retina. So it's just all about melatonin at the same time, every time. Irregular sleep-wake pattern, lack of clearly defined circadian rhythm of sleep and wake. Prevalence is really unknown because it's not real common. Why? Because it's associated with neurocognitive impairment and kids that might have some genetic propensity for um, uh, cognitive impairment or mental retardation. Here's the problem. The diagnostic criteria say that could not, should not be better explained by a medical, neurological, or mental disorder. Well, the only time you ever see it is in a medical, neurological, or mental disorder. So I give this only to say there's some things in medicine that are dumb. You have a diagnosis, it's impossible. You, you, can't really, you can't really give it. So bright light and therapy and melatonin can be used in the bulk of your circadian rhythm abnormalities. Appropriate timing is absolutely crucial in that. Um, you really got to pay attention to the circadian phase 
to really decide how you're going to institute that, that therapy. Um, the bright light therapy administered, remember the core body temperature nadir uh, and how that will shift whether you give it before or after and melatonin timing is very important as well. Question. No questions? See, I got you out 15 minutes already. <laughs> Much appreciated. Um, yeah. Do you have any questions? Y'all are experts. No, we wouldn't say no. that. <laughs> I like your I like your comments about the diagnosis are impossible because we've been through a lot of DSM five and you start losing some of those, you kind of go, well, how would you know? It's very subjective. It comes down to what the evaluator thinks. Yep. And you can make